Okay, before we get started, I want to talk about the Council of Chalcedon and the apophatic ethic. So, um, who here has taken evangelical theology? Has everyone here taken evangelical theology? Two people have not, okay. Um, <clears throat> so the Council of Chalcedon in 451 was, was uh, preceded by the Council of Nicaea, which discussed uh, two main issues. What did the Council of Nicaea discuss? The nature of the Trinity and yes. What about the Son? S O N or S U N? S O N. Yes. The the dual nature of Christ. So a quick way of remembering Nicaea is to think about the um, the hand gestures that you see more liturgical churches uh, hold, or almost any church father or picture in church history. Uh, we'll either have this, 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 or this. Reason being, there's always three fingers showing the three persons of the Trinity, and there's always two fingers showing the dual nature of Christ. So there's never going to be a time where you're going to see this or this. There's always two fingers connected, but traditionally it's, it's this or this. So the two natures of Christ, which are both God and man, and the three persons of the Trinity, which are... Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right. So, Council of Chalcedon came along because people were wondering, okay, so we do know that there is the, the dual nature of Christ, the man and God together, but how do they interact with each other? And that was the question for the Council of Chalcedon. The um, Nestorians said they were wrestling with the tension of kind of like um, Smeagol and Gollum in Lord of the Rings, two natures existing in one body that were constantly at odds with each other. If you've read or seen Lord of the Rings, you know that Smeagol and Gollum have this, this back and forth. The two natures are fighting and they have separate goals. Uh, and the Chalcedonian Council said that's, that's clearly not true. There's no scriptural evidence for that. But we still don't know what it is. And there were other, um, there were other types of understandings of, well, maybe Jesus was God, but he sacrificed his God nature, etc. So there was all this discussion. And so what the Council of Chalcedon concluded with an apophatic ethic, was that there are four things that we do not know, or I'm sorry, that we know that the dual nature is not. Okay, I need everyone with me. The two natures of Christ are not, uh, or it is without confusion, without division, without mingling, and without confusion. Did I say confusion twice? Okay. Without confusion, mingling, oh, I had them out. Mingling, confusion, division, and separation. Those are the four things. We know that the dual natures of Christ are neither mingling, confused, divided, or separated. So the reason I bring this up is because what we have is what's called an apophatic ethic or an apophatic argument. Apophatic means argued not by what it is, but by what it is not. This means that when someone says, explain to me the dual nature of Christ, the Council of Chalcedon says, we don't know. We know certain things. Paul is very clear that Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father. We know that Jesus is very clear in John 14 through 17 that if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. So we, we know certain things to be clear, but we can't explain every single nuance and the, the complications of of. Uh, of this dual nature. But we do know that it's not four things. Without mingling, confusion, division, or separation. The reason I bring this up is that this class has a lot of apophatic answers, especially as we start to talk about the role of technology and marketing in the world today, especially for Christians. If someone comes to you and says, what does ethical marketing look like? We cannot give them a straight ABC answer. But what we can do is we can say, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, it is not this, 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 and this. In the same way that love for one child may be manifested differently than love for another child, differently from love for another child. Some love requires more discipline at times. Some love requires holding the hand at times. We can't know exactly what it is not, but we know that love can never manipulate. 
that can never harm, etc. And so as we talk about this issue of ethical uses of marketing and technology, we're not gonna come to a conclusion of what it is, but we will absolutely come to conclusions about what it is not. And in that way, I think we're practicing things that have been um, congruent throughout church history. So we talked about three things, or you guys watched three videos. You watched one article, I didn't put the article on here. Tristan Harris, who helped design the Gmail app. He was a software engineer for Apple. He was a founder and CEO of a company that was bought by Google. Uh, we have Sean Parker, uh, who was a co-founder of Napster, and he was the first president of Facebook. And then we have Chamath Palahapataya, the head of AIM in 2004, and he was an executive at Facebook. So, now I want to hear from you all, what were some thoughts that you had as we discuss, or as, as you watched these videos? What were some takeaways that you had? Maybe let's start with Tristan Harris. Tristan Harris was the video, the CNN or CBS or something exclusive talking about um, your phone is destroying your life. That was the conversation. I can't remember this is from that video. I should, have, I should have been there which video this is from. Well, then let's scrap that idea. Um, <laughs> but I think one of the big takeaways for me was, uh, I think it was this guy who said that um, about 50 people affect a billion people's lives uh, through, through their coding and, and social media. And just the fact that those 50 people are uh, having that effect that wide of effect yep. um, as far as like anxiety yeah. on our younger, like younger generation yeah. is uh, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. I think it was Chamath or Chamath, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Yeah, he said something to the extent of one more than a billion or like two billion people's lives are being controlled by 30 people, mostly men, 20 to 35 living in California. And Chamath goes even farther. What does he say about the decisions that they have made? What is the impact it's having on culture and society at large? That it's tearing apart the fabric of the way that we historically interact with them. Yeah, tearing apart the fabric of society is the vocabulary he uses. That's pretty steep implications that he's talking about. What are your thoughts on that idea that that the things that these people are deciding are changing society. Would you agree or would you disagree? Marjorie? <laughs> the communication and just the way that we can like interact with people, the way that we're like we're present online but we're also present in person. And uh -huh. it's it's so rare <clears throat> that we can like like you just said, we need to be like whenever we're near someone, it's not like on social media, there's so much information already accessible to yeah. you, and like nothing's really that private anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's like hard for me to like imagine just because I'm kind of like growing up in this generation, mm -hmm. so yeah, that's how life is now. Right. But I haven't always been that way. Yeah, I uh, I totally agree. Uh, a good friend of mine, James Cook, who is a professor, he is a adjunct professor of history, and he is uh, he's in an emissions counselor for uh, engineering and CEM. He married his wife, as people do, their spouses. Um, but he met her on a blind date set up from some friends. Um, they were set up, and I, I worked in the same office with James at that time, and we were all wondering who is this girl that James is going on a blind date with. James is not really the kind of person we would expect to go on a blind date, but he was kind of like, what the heck? I trust my friends, I'll do it. And we were all like, tell us about her. And he's like, I don't know. Aren't you going to look her up? And he goes, I don't think so. I think I just kind of want to let her speak for herself. And we, of course, were already like huddled behind the computer and we're like, okay, so here's what Kendra looks like. Here's her family, et cetera. We, were all, we all knew these things that James didn't going into, going into this blind date. Um, yeah, but that stuck with me, that idea that he was just kind of like, I kind of want to let her speak for herself. So I definitely think that that's a, that's a truism. And, and this isn't necessarily new to 20, um, 2018. It's been going on for a long time. I remember in, <clears throat> this is embarrassing, in eighth grade, there was a girl at school. Her name was Barbara De Leon. <laughs> Barbara, I had such a crush on her. Oh my gosh. We went to school together, went to church together, and I like never talked to her in person. <laughs> but after school, we chatted on AIM, that's AOL Instant Messenger, all the time. And we even had an acronym. She was like my official best friend, OBF. And we interacted online 
all the time. I like got home from school, I was like, I gotta chat with Barbara. So we chatted. And I remember one time, I remember where I was standing in Washington Junior High's cafeteria where we were standing next to each other in the lunch line. And it was like, hey Barbara, hey. And we didn't talk the entire line. It was like the most painfully awkward because I'm like, I don't know how to interact with you. But when I got home, game on. Um, so this is certainly not, not a new problem. Um, maybe that's just me. But, but I know that it's easy sometimes to feel like other people are being dramatic when they're like, you don't know how to interact at all. But then I'm like, let's stop it. And then I look back at myself, I'm like, oh, maybe that's just some truth. I would say with, um, I say his name, Chamath, Thomas? Let's say Chamath. Chamath. When he was talking in his video, too, he was, you know, he mentioned a lot um, us individually taking responsibility for, you know, I said, like, yeah, I mean, I think kind of his main point was just that, like, it starts with individuals, like, in yeah. scripture. It starts with you taking responsibility for you, your actions and your usage of the thing. Which the thing being social media or you know apps or whatever it is that controls your life. And for me, for me, it always begins with the question of um, you know, okay, so we, we say that they have control over our lives, you know, but where is the point where we take responsibility for our own usage? And you know, yep. they can do a lot of things to manipulate. But, you know, I can't, I, 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 don't, I don't think I can say, well, the reason I use Facebook so much is because someone tricked me into doing it, you know, and, right. um, you know, so, I mean, I get that there's <clears throat> some ethical lines there, but, you know, I mean, it's, you know, like, an, another example would be, like, with, you know, um, the sale of tobacco. Like, yes, um, that's a great, great point. Keep going. I like where yeah, you're going. Yeah, the sale of tobacco. You know, um, tobacco companies aren't allowed to advertise on in any way, really, except for a gas station for their packaging. And so by doing that, someone else is saying, you don't have the wherewithal to decide for yourself mm -hmm. what you're going to so we have to make the decision for you of not allowing tobacco to advertise. Yep. Um, and so I think there's a lot of implications for a lot of different products that, you know, it's like, does the government tell us, you know, does, does the government decide, oh, you guys are all stupid and we need to take control? Or, right. Yep. I mean, and that's yeah. what it gets yeah. down to, you know, and I don't honestly have an answer for what's ethical and what's not as far as, like, the responsibility of these companies. But I would rather believe that I have more control than, you know, I have enough control of my own self that I don't need someone else to say, you can't advertise this, you can't add this bill to this app, right. you know, because Austin's not going to be able to control himself. Right. Yeah, yeah. There, I really like that point because it, 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 the issue that you're bringing up is who is responsible? Is it the consumer or is it the provider? And we can't hold Walmart responsible if someone goes and buys Vicodin and liquor. Now, I don't know if, our, if Walmart sells liquor, but you see my point. If you, if you buy two products that are legal and then use them to, um, that ends up, you end up dying because of overdosing or whatever, can you hold Walmart responsible for selling those products? Probably not. Um, can you hold a car company responsible for a car crash you got in? Maybe if it's a self-driving car completely. But, but unless, I mean, you're behind the wheel, literally and figuratively. Um, and so that becomes a really interesting conversation. Chamath brought up an example from linked, I'm sorry, from WhatsApp. He mentioned it with India. He didn't really finish the story. Y'all familiar with that story? In link, or on WhatsApp in India, there's a time where somehow a story got started at some point about uh, people who are coming in, strangers coming into villages who are members of gangs who are taking children. And that story spread 
and <clears throat> it was not true, but strangers who were entering villages were killed, lynched, murdered. Seven innocent people, more, were killed because of a rumor that was started somehow. Is WhatsApp to be held responsible for that? That's a really hard question. All I've done was provide a service that can do so much good. To what extent should people be, or should they be held responsible for the people who've done wrong with it? And like you said, uh, Austin, it goes to the conversation of legislating morality and ethics. It's great if we agree with someone who's in power to legislate morality, but it gets scary when someone that we don't agree with is in power of any sort, and then they've got their own set of morals, and they're forcing it on other people. Uh, I, I, I find that the older people get, the quicker they are to applaud people that use their freedoms in a way that they agree with and shun people that use their freedoms uh, in a way they disagree with. Meaning, um, I know many people, family included, who would praise Tim Tebow for being public with his faith, using that platform to profess his faith. Praising uh, an actor who gets up at the Oscars and says, I wanna thank the Lord Jesus Christ for getting me here. But when then someone gets forward and talks about the Me Too movement or Black Lives Matter, they say, oh, here comes someone else using their platform to teach us something that it's not their job to tell us. We're quick to, to say, hey, if you're talking about my morality, I'm all in for you implementing it. But if I disagree, I don't wanna hear it. And in fact, you're, you are forcing me to do something I don't wanna do. So that's a really hard question. Okay, so let's talk, go ahead. Oh, I just said you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, question yes, yes. Okay, so let's talk about starting with the individual. Um, what is Chamath, Chamath talking about when he says, uh, start with the individual, and what are some examples we might have that either these people gave or that you can think of, <laughs> starting with the individual? We saw Tristan show an example of what he does on a coffee. He was sitting at a coffee table and he showed his phone to the interviewer. What did he show her? Usurpers so and glass that won't take time, a useless time. Okay, tell me more about those, about what he was saying with those apps. Uh, I'm trying to remember now. Um, it's been a while. But uh, I think he said something along the lines of those are the apps that were essential to, to the use and they weren't going to eat up uh, time or drop in. Right. Spend useless time on them. Yep. And all the other ones, uh, especially the ones that would take a lot of time under like a hidden folder. Yep. Yeah, so he, he gave the example Google Maps. I'm never going to go into Google Maps and then 30 minutes later say, What have I been doing? He, he kind of just goes in, he gets out. And it's really interesting to look at the apps that he has uh, for those. Uh, that's something that when I first watched this several months ago, I started. My phone only has the apps that I use. Um, for a select amount of time on my home screen. It's amazing how that's changed it. It's amazing to me how putting all of my social media in one folder on another page changes how I interact with it. When I have, if I have LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, all on my home page in separate icons, I'm so much more inclined to look at it. Putting them on a folder on my home screen was one thing, but moving that folder to the second page, it's amazing how much little I think about it. Uh, so I really, really agree um, with what he says there. Um, what are some other ways starting with the individual could look like? In any sort. Um, my, er, my friend's family has a rule in their house of one screen at a time. So it's like they're, walk, they're all watching like a movie or TV, like they can't be on their phones or their laptops or all Yeah. Uh, kind of reduce that. Um, yeah, just multiple screens at a time. Because normally you're like on your phone and watching a movie mm -hmm. or on your laptop and you know, things like that. So. That's great. Yeah. What are some other things like that that you've heard about? Friends or your house or something you try and do yourself? I don't sleep with my phone on my bed, so I plug it in in another room and go to bed. Yeah. Have you seen, did you, how long have you been doing that? Probably for the last year or so. Are you satisfied with it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I mean, there's not even a thought. It's just, I'm going to bed now. So. Yeah. Did you choose to do that as a response to something? Um, yeah. So just like my personal struggles with um, God, 
things that guys struggle with yeah. and scrolling and yeah. just things that like pull me. In. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah. Chip and Dan Heath are an author of several books. One of them is called Switch, How to Change When Change is Hard. And I love what they talk about when they say shaping the environment. Um, there's a chapter called Shaping the Environment. In it, they talk about shaping the environment means making the right decisions easier and the hard decision or the wrong decisions harder. Little things like that. I would say that putting apps on your home screen is a great example of making the wrong decision just a little bit harder. It's the reason that you lay out clothes if you want to go work out in the morning. If you see the clothes there, it's like, well, okay. It's the reason you set an alarm in the morning. We're, we shape our path in every way in life. Um, but setting your phone in the other room, that's, that's such a valuable way of saying, I'm going to go to bed not being with technology. I'm going to wake up not being with technology for many purposes. I think another one I've heard, I've never done this or seen this with anyone, but uh, just so like, say you went out to dinner with some friends, mm -hmm. everyone puts their phones in the middle, mm -hmm. the first person to reach for their phone has to pay. We've done that. Or Yikes. pay for appetizers or yeah. something. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I love that Chick-fil-A did that, uh, the family You'll see the family boxes where like you can go and you can get a family box and you all put your phones in there and then once you're done eating you come and like retrieve or show them that your phones have been in there the whole time and you get like free ice cream. Huh. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's so it's like cool. encouraging family dinner time. <laughs> <laughs> I know uh, Simon Sinek. Uh, he's an author. Start with why leaders eat last. He has a video that's online about millennials and about decision making. And one of the things he talks about is he said, when my friends and I go out to eat, one of us brings our phone. That's it. He said, the other, we don't, one person, so that if something happens, we know we can take care of something. But the rest of it, we just don't need it. So that, that's one way that he has tried to shape the path. Um, playing the victim, that's something uh, awesome that you brought up. This idea that who's to blame, is it them or is it us? What do you guys think about this idea of playing the victim of, maybe playing the victim, that's a heavy handed phrase, um, about putting responsibility on the company, not on ourselves? What do you think when you think about that, that reaction? Is it fair? Marjorie shaking her head no. Why not? Did you say on the company or not? Putting the blame on the company or um, what do you think about when someone makes an accusation and you say, or and they say, well, the company has created it like this and the phones are like this and the this is like this? Um, I don't think so because, like, even when we're talking about, like, the other products and stuff, like, if someone went and bought, like, two different things at Walmart and then used them for, like, harm, I think that that falls into a lot of personal responsibility because... There are a lot of different products out there that have purposes or they can be used for great good, but if used in the wrong way or used in an irresponsible way, they mm -hmm. can be used for evil purposes even or even just yeah. foolish purposes like, I think, knives. Like, mm -hmm. knives can be great for cutting chicken and for, you know, cutting down trees or whatever. It's <laughs> a big knife. <laughs> blades, blades. <laughs> Slicing. <laughs> but... <Wow. laughs> Uh, but you can use, you know, sharp objects. Right. There are a lot of purposes, but they can also be used to stab people. And, right. You know, do terrible things. Right. So I think social media is one way that's kind of like shortened distances, but something my grandpa would say was like, back to my mom when the phone was a big thing, you know, like talking on the phone for a long time. Mm -hmm. He's like, you know, phone wasn't meant to lengthen your conversations, it was just meant to shorten distances. So mm -hmm. instead of, you know, Using that as an excuse to be like, okay, like I'm always going to be with people now. Because like, even like, you know, in person, we're not going to spend every single waking moment with people. Like, we will have breaks that we're by ourselves and recharging and doing things like that. So I think it's just in the the responsible way that you use it. Yeah. So there was that quote from I think it was Tristan who, when he was talking about Netflix. He said that the CEO of Netflix was saying that the number one, or the, the number one and two and three, the top competitors of Netflix are YouTube, Facebook, and sleep. 
when we talk about assuming responsibility for ourselves, at what point do we look at a company and say, but at the same time, you should be doing something responsibly and ethically. Do you know why they put, I was trying to find this, why they put the like, are you still watching button? Because that was one thing I thought it would like. Oh, interesting. Um, a company, not necessarily stopping, but you right. know, like, hey, you know, you've been on here for five hours. Are you sure you want to continue? Or is it something like, I didn't, I didn't know if that was for them for, like yeah. It's a great question. Their numbers or that was yeah, I wonder if it has to do with that. It could have to do possibly with um, a family that has five Netflix accounts, and then let's say there's six people in the family or seven or something like that, <clears throat> and one of them realizes I can't get on Netflix, and Netflix is kind of like trying to prioritize. Possibly that that could be an answer, or it could be bandwidth restrictions. I don't know. That's a great question, though. Because that could be an ethical, maybe, response, trying to, but it doesn't really stop people. I haven't heard someone, that when they're watching Netflix and the, are you still watching? They think, you know what? Maybe I shouldn't be watching anymore. Well played, Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. I've been out once past, like, So what do you think about the responsibility of the leaders of companies? Go for it. And I wouldn't necessarily say that 100% back this statement. Good. Just, just for the sake of throwing something out there, um, I'd say that the companies, that they're responsible for trying to get you to spend as much time on their app as you would so they can make money so that they can appease their shareholders. That's right. That is the number one purpose of a business is to please your shareholders to some extent, right? Because if you don't please your shareholders, then what happens? And what happens if your business tanks? You are out of a job. So all of a sudden we have this dilemma. IND is going to stand for individual. CORP is going to stand for corporation or corporate. So a corporation has to uh, smiley face shareholders. Shareholders. And then dollar sign employees. Okay, what else does a corporation need to do? Or any business, service provider, goods maker? Keep people coming back. Yep, continued revenue. Very few are uh, companies like Nance Machine, which is on the way to Walmart if you go the back way. Like if you're getting by Ravenwood, there's Nance Machine. And I remember hearing that they sell like three or four pieces of equipment a year. And those four pieces of equipment make the whole thing go around. Very rare are companies like that, where it's like, if we sell 100 in 30 years, <laughs> then, then, we're, then we're good to go. I don't think that's the case with most. Um, so we need to have people coming back. Revenue, not revenue, revenue. Okay. Should ethics play into it at all? Um, I think that. Sorry, I'll let someone else talk. <laughs> <laughs> think on that for just a second. What else? Or I'm sorry. Should ethics have a part in it? I mean, it's hard because ethics is kind of subjective. Um, yes. So where where do you draw the line on what is ethical? Yeah. And what is not? Yep. That's huge. Um, ethical nuance. We'll call that. Meaning the gray area 
we've got clearly right and clearly wrong, and then we've got all this stuff in the middle that when worded correctly could be right, when used in the wrong way could be wrong, etc. There's also something um, I want to go to Aristotle in his Nicomachean Ethics. He writes about, we'll write this down here, arete, arete, which is virtue, as he would define it. But Aristotle makes a very interesting argument that I totally, totally, totally agree with. I promise that's not facetious. That sounded like I, <laughs> that sounded like I don't agree with him. Um, this, this is like one of the main things that I want to teach my kids. Um, and one of the main things that I want to teach students and people. Aristotle says that no one ever makes, this is me summarizing him, no one ever makes a decision because they think it's the wrong thing to do. Every time someone makes a decision, in any way, it's because they believe it to be right. So, people do what they believe is good. Which means that as nice as it is to say about a terrorist, that person is so insane and stupid and wrong, that certainly doesn't get us anywhere about solving a problem. Because the problem is not the action, although that is, I mean, that is the problem, but the problem begins with what do you believe is good? So there's no one out there like we heard about from Tristan and Sean and Chamath. There's no one out there that's saying, we need to manipulate people. We want to ruin society. We want to change people's brains chemically, historically, for all time. That's not the discussion that's happening. Instead, they're doing what they believe to be good. And that's where we get into this question of ethical nuance is, well, different people believe different things to be good all the time, all across the world. Now, again, we're not necessarily reaching a specific answer. We're just kind of leaning in and seeing what happens. So let's pause here. We've kind of talked a little bit about corporation and how they're doing what they believe to be right, because that's how people are. Um, let's talk about individuals. What do we want in life? Happiness. Happiness. What else do we want? Control. Control. I think we want ease. What are some other things we want? Fun. Fun. Money. Money. I guess um, British people want money too. So I put the <laughs> I put a really bad pound sign. That's that's really bad. Uh, looks more like a hangman. Um, okay. So what are some other things we want? Belonging. Belonging. Yeah. And I think with belonging comes relationships. There's other things. Purpose. Purpose. That's great. So let's take a pause there. And let's talk about... For contrast sake, we're going to use black here. Um, define to me what a tool is. Uh, not the band that has the album 10,000 Days and not someone that goes shirtless into Walmart and pushes people around. Um, <laughs> what, is a, what is another type of tool? What's, what is a tool? What? Sorry, uh, Tristan, the, the, how we defined Google Maps was using the tool versus like, the other things. So I was trying to 
Okay, so why, why do you think he would say that Google Maps is a tool? But that's the word he used. Why do you think he would say that, though? Oh, uh, because it's just, it's just meant to assist you for a certain amount of time. Okay, so it's meant for assistance. Meant for assistance. Um, so another inference that you just made is limited. Yeah. Limited in scope. Meaning it's not meant to help every single thing of your life, but it's for a... There's, there's some sort of impact. Okay, so limited purpose. So there's a time where it's not purposeful anymore. Okay? What else? When we think of tool, I mean, think big picture. Gutenberg Press, automobile. The the plow, the, the, the stone, fire. I mean, let's, let's, human history, what's a tool? It helps you accomplish Yes, yes. Accomplishing tasks. What else? Used to carry out a particular function. Carry out, is that from? Functional. Functional, okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> there we go. Functional. That's great. Okay. I think in the context of what Tristan Harris had to say, um, it would be something, a product or something that is neutral. Interesting. How? How? Neutral in that it doesn't seek any benefit for itself, but it's perfect. It's specifically there for you. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So neutral um, only for y only for your good. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm trying to remember what. Uh, uh, this is going to get me. This is probably a waste of time. What if I loaded up like Homestar Runner or something? That, that really was a total waste of time. Uh, rules of ro robotics. Um, yeah, I read this last night. Uh, that's why I got it. <laughs> okay, so uh, the three laws of robotics. A robot may not injure a human being or allow an, a human being Come to harm, a robot must obey orders given by human beings, except when such orders would conflict with the first law, and a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. The, these discussions have been going on for a long time. When we're talking about engineering, when we're talking about what is the role of creating something that's job is to help us. Its job is, or it may not injure or bring us to harm. It must obey all orders unless it comes against the first one, and then it must protect itself to stay alive unless that negates the first or second. So Hal from um, 2001 A Space Odyssey certainly uh, was not a very good robot. Um, okay, so when we talk about functionality, I'm going to argue that a tool is only only as functional duh, as the user is um, say that again competent. competent yes no 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 I think Sarah's grandmother is not very good with Google because there was once a time that we were driving on the road, as you do, and she, she, saw, she saw a billboard for Google and she said, what is Google? I don't know that word. I don't like it. So, so Google's not going to be very useful for her in regards to competence. Um, as, as the user is competent, as the user is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Is aware of this is this is the the thing we're getting to need and 
proper usage. Okay, a tool is only as functional as the user is aware of need and proper usage. So to bring it all together, here's one thing that I'm arguing today. Here we have little individual. Uh, that's a messed up chin they've got. Um, the individual wants to accomplish something. However, I'm going Roman's road on us. Uh, however, we can't, <laughs> the user can't accomplish something unless they use the services provided by someone who's created a tool. So the user has to use the tool as a conduit to get itself there. And we've seen this throughout history all the time. Person wants to get warm, person needs fire. Person wants to uh, send a book to another country, so they invent the Gutenberg Press. People need electricity, and so on and so forth. People need X, and so they go to Y. People need X, and so they go to Y. Okay, but here's the question that I have for us. Does Y need X? In that case, absolutely. Yes, because of these things. The corporation cannot exist by itself unless all of their employees are their shareholders and they're dedicated to the cause, in which case they're a cult. Um, <laughs> So the individual needs the corporation. The corporation, in the same way, we're going to give him or her a tie, a little tie. Um, <clears throat> the corporation needs to reach a goal. They need the individual, et cetera, et cetera. But here's the area that I think that these people nail. Aware of need and proper use. Because we take... We need happiness, control, ease, fun, money, belonging, relationships, and purpose. And we define these things incorrectly. And so when we define them incorrectly, we seek incorrect solutions. And when we define them solely based off of what corporations tell us we need, then we start to eat the food that they give us blindly. We have stopped being aware of our need, and we are only aware of what they're providing. And this is where I think Chamath is, um, is right on. He says, you have to realize, he says to this, this group of Stanford business students, you are being programmed. And it feels like I'm watching some sort of like sci-fi show or Black Mirror or something, but it's like real life. It's really, really happening that people, instead of saying, how can I use these things that are provided to meet my needs, I am looking and saying, what are the needs that you want to provide? And I'll just take it passively. And this is where things get really dangerous. This is when people stop saying, I have limits. This is when people start to play victim and they start to say things like, all I'm doing is just reading something or watching something or doing this, we start to miss out on what matters in life because we have illusions. So we start, we trade in happiness for pithy videos. We trade in control for games. We trade in ease for shallow conversations. We do the same with relationships. We trade in fun, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Money's a harder one. I guess we trade in for Bitcoin. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and so the issue here comes when we are digital marketers, when we are people who are running the world because we will be and you will be. 
what are we going to tell people that they need? Because what changes the world is 30, 20 to 35 year old men in California. And why? Because they've told us what we need and we believe it. And in many ways, they've made the world better. Chamath is, is first to say that. He says, Facebook is overwhelmingly doing good. Which I would agree, in many ways. But there comes a point where we have to look at our life, we have to create a value system for ourselves, and we have to say, does this help me reach my goal? If the answer is no, it's out. We're willing to say that about diets. We're willing to say that about financial success. We're willing to say that about spouses. We're willing to say that about so many things to say, I have a goal, and if this is not it, I'm out. And yet in this area with technology and digital media, we are quick to say, tell me what I need. And this is where things get messy. And this, the reason we're talking about it in this class is because every single form of digital marketing is telling someone that they need something more. Everything. Even the most well-meaning, right now media, the Christian Netflix as they've called themselves, we've got new Bible studies that we think will benefit you. So telling someone that they could use something is certainly not inherently sinful, right? But if we abuse that power, then we can really, really damage the world. And these kind of things start not necessarily, you don't have to be a 31-year-old man in California to, to make these changes. It's parents. It's RAs. It's teachers. It's doctors. It's anyone in relationships. I'm beginning to feel like I'm the guy in a beautiful mind writing on the, <laughs> writing on the, the mirror. Anyone in relationships has the power to tell someone else what they need or don't need. So I would encourage you to surround yourselves with people that are seeking common goals. Or if you're not someone that you think is seeking the right goal, be willing to challenge that. But from this class's perspective, there are several takeaways, I think. One is that we have to commit to companies and organizations that we believe in. I do not think that we can be complicit when we know that something wrong is being done. I also think that if we know that something wrong is being done, then we have a responsibility to say something about it. So what that means practically is if you're working for a business and you find out that there are unethical, that, you, that the clothing that the business sells is being made in an unethical manner and that people are being paid below minimum wage, I think you've got to do something about it. Once you become aware of something, I think you have to say something because if not, you're telling people they need something that is causing harm to the world. I also think that we have to, to will, be willing to realize the implications of what we are doing. We have to be willing to say that. I market for universities all across the US. I am making a claim on these students that I've never met. Hundreds of thousands of students, I put messages from different colleges in front of their lives telling them that this college could be the thing that drives them to where they need to be. That's a big responsibility that I have. Because to some extent, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm telling a story of a university that is not great for students? These are the kind of questions we have to be willing to ask ourselves over and over and over. Are we telling people that they need something that they actually need? Are we even phrasing it in a way that removes the word need? 
For instance, we don't say, you are perfect for this university. We say something like, LVC is ready, are you? That puts the ball back into the student's court. It's not telling them, this is the perfect solution to your life. Uh, I don't say that up submitting your application will get you one step closer to the best years of your life. I say it could get you one step closer to the best years of your life. When we start claiming that we know exactly what people need and we know exactly what's happening, then we are, as we started talking about at the beginning of class, we're playing God. So I don't, again, I'm not claiming that I know exactly what the right issue is, but I do know that we can define things that it isn't. So let's talk about those for a second. What are some things that we know it is not? That ethical marketing is not. I'm gonna erase this. Am I gonna do erase this? You guys don't care about what I wrote. <clears throat> what are some things that ethical marketing is not? Manipulative. Manipulative. What else? What, what do you mean by manipulative? Because it's, it's pretty subjective. Bingo. Back to whoever said that. Hmm? Whoever said manipulative. Can I answer that question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess like using people for your own advantage and they're maybe in, in a way that's potentially harmful to them. Okay. So using in a way, perhaps it's not in their best interest. Yeah. That is not in their best interest. Slash harm. Now again, what do we mean by best interest? How do we know? What is harmful? Are we responsible? I'm not sure that we can know that, but we know this. Okay, what's the ethical marketing? What's another thing it is not? I'd say hateful or maybe excluding of a certain group of people or person in general. Hateful, exclusive. Exclusive, that's a, that's a weird, um, um, what's a better way of saying that? Excluding. There's another place. Uh, I would say ethical marketing is not promising what you cannot return. What does that mean? So let me give you an example of that. Promising that enrollment in a university will give you the best years of your life. <laughs> <laughs> what's, another, what's another example of that that I did give five minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> like a something workout promising that if you do this, like, if you buy these shoes or whatever, like, you will lose the pounds. Mm -hmm. When it's kind of not up to the shoes or mm -hmm. necessarily. Yeah. Or like, I, what comes to mind is like, all those Facebook schemes you see where it's like, if you use my five-step plan, you'll make 100000 in a year or something. You know, some <laughs> stupid thing like that. Yeah. Yep. Um, I thought it has $100,000 now, but. Lobby <laughs> <laughs> um, Castleman in a Christian Foundations class I took with her in grad school. She said, theology is a very particular field of study with a very particular vocabulary, and every word you say matters. I would say that applies to marketing too. Mm -hmm. That changing a couple words from how you will make $100,000 using my steps versus how I made $100,000 using these steps. That is something that I can guarantee is true. I cannot guarantee it for you. This is why customer testimonials are so valuable because it is their story. If, some, if a customer says, I lost 30 pounds doing this workout, 
We're going to highlight that because I cannot promise that's going to happen for you. I think going back to what we talked about, ethical marketing is not um, calling calling want need. What I mean by that is simply a corporation should absolutely say more money is fun and a belonging is great. But when we start claiming that you absolutely need this, we're claiming that we know what sufficiency for these people are. That's where we get really dangerous. Um, there are several more things. If not, I'm sure we're going to continue discussing these things. Um, there was not really a perfect time to go over this lesson or this discussion because that's just the way this class is structured. Um, and so we will revisit this. But over and over and over, I want you to be thinking when you see advertisements, when you're looking at advertisements, when you're reading the text, to say, does it really give you what's needed to be human, to thrive in humanity? What are they claiming? Are they manipulative, et cetera, et cetera? Um, last thing I'm going to say today, because you guys got to get out of here, this is a book uh, by a man named Andy Crouch. It's called The Tech Wise Family. This book, as you can see, is fairly small. Um, this book talks about ethical use of technology in your homes. Um, he's writing it towards families, but I wouldn't say that it's just for parents at all. Um, the whole book is essentially this question, what is the purpose of a family? And he argues that the purpose of a family is for the development of people. So in light of that definition, how does technology help or harm? And so there's 10 chapters with practical steps. Um, for instance, we don't have a TV in our living room. Instead, we have things that we can be creative with, like a piano, a canvas, a book. Uh, he says things like one hour every week, or one hour every day, one day every week, and one week every year, my family does a total technology fast. Um, we, put the f we do not go to sleep right after using our phones, or we don't use our phones right when we wake up. And it's interesting because he's writing from a Christian perspective. So if you're interested in this discussion of how can I apply technology properly in my own life, this book is really good. You may push it away and you're like, I don't agree with that, but I think the discussion that happens in here is really great. Uh, I also think this would be a great thing to discuss with friends, a Bible study, a book study, or with a significant other. So there's a little book uh, for the day. So I'd love to talk more, um, but we all got to go. So thank you for class today. And uh, I don't think we have anything else. Nope. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.